I'd like to introduce Lee Mason to all of you. I believe we have Lee on the phone. There he is. Lee is the Deputy Chief Engineer at NASA and uh, previously has been a power and propulsion technologist at NASA's Glenn Research Center for almost 30 years. He has developed and advised a really amazing range of power systems for deep space science and exploration, which has led to over 100 technical publications, several patents, and numerous awards. So we're very fortunate to also have Lee's time with us today. With that, Lee, I will pass you the baton and uh, go ahead and take it over. Yeah, great. Thank you, Ariel. Can you hear me okay? Indeed. Well, uh, you put me in an awkward position following Ron, who is obviously the world's smartest guy about Apollo missions and knows more about the moon than, than you know many of us. So uh, he's told you a lot of things that I could never begin to tell you. Uh, so I, I do uh, feel uh, you know a little bit awkward following Ron. Uh, anyway, I, I was hoping to talk a little bit about space power systems and specifically uh, systems for the moon. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not the chief engineer for NASA, just to be clear, I'm the chief and uh, deputy chief engineer for the Space Technology Mission Directorate. Um, for your students, just to kind of clarify, there's kind of three main mission directorates within NASA. There's the group that does human exploration, you know, flying missions to the moon and so forth, ISS, uh, Orion, SLS, those kind of activities. Uh, then there's the science mission directorate. Those are the folks flying the, you know, deep space science missions, things like Pluto New Horizons and recent Perseverance rover that was done by the science mission directorate. And then the third mission directorate, the one I belong to, um, is the uh, space technology mission directorate. Um, space technology mission directorate is the group that develops new technologies that supports both the human exploration side and the space science side. And that's where I work. So while I've been serving in this position as the chief engineer in space technology, I, I spent about 30 years at NASA Glenn Research Center, mostly working advanced power and propulsion systems and a heavy influence on nuclear technology. So uh, that, that's really my formal background. I, I was involved uh, in a lot of the early studies done on RTGs and advanced RTGs. I, Ron mentioned the, the SNAP-27 uh, devices used on Apollo, but we have an ongoing program to develop uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generators and other type systems that use plutonium-238. And I also have a very strong background in fission power systems, and you'll hear a little bit about that in my talk today. So this is a chart that uh, Space Technology uh, uh, tech, uh, Mission Directorate shows to, to kind of highlight our portfolio of technologies we're working on. And we do it through what we call a strategic framework. Um, that framework uh, is, is basically divided into four categories, go, land, live, and explore. You see that at the bottom of the screen. And, and so we have a, a, a pretty broad technology program to address those kind of requirements, you know, going, the propulsion technologies, landing, the technologies needed to um, for entry, descent, and, and landing, which is um, critical to the moon in terms of things like uh, landing accuracy and plume surface interactions. On uh, Mars, it's even more important, as we just saw in the Perseverance landing, you know, getting through that Martian atmosphere. Uh, live then means to, to work on surfaces, planetary surfaces like the Moon and Mars, and then explore kind of captures the, the broader science goals of the agency, you know, beyond the Moon and Mars to distant, uh, you know, other science targets. And you can see all the activities we're involved in, you know, especially those on the moon, um, things like dust mitigation. You know, Ron just talked about all the issues with dust. We have a, a program, a project uh, devoted to uh, addressing that uh, precision landing, being able to land on the edges of craters, which is a goal that we have for some of these lunar missions. Um, we're involved in ISRU very heavily. So, you know, looking at, uh, mining the moon, either ice or oxygen from regolith to uh, produce propellant that we could use to power our missions that might go to Mars or return to Earth. Um, cryogenic fluid management is another very important focus area for us. Um, you know, the idea of being able to store cryogens for these big vehicles 
um, also to store cryogens after they've been mined on the moon. Um, things that, that's a very difficult thermal challenge and one we're trying to address in STMD. And you can see some of the other things, I, I won't dwell on them, but uh, suffice it to say, there's a broad por portfolio of things we're working on. And, and to the extent that we can, we're developing technologies that are multi-mission. Uh, that is, they can be used on the moon and with maybe minor modifications or adaptations also be used on, on Mars. So um, I think Ron did a great job of, of kind of describing our, our human lunar mission plans, but uh, this chart uh, attempts to summarize those. And so uh, we were given direction by um, the former uh, administration to send return humans to the moon by 2024. Um, and so we've been working on that. We're, we're, I think we're waiting further direction from our new president as to the priorities and, and the dates may change, but I think the emphasis will be the same. Uh, I think we'll still be focused on the moon as a, as a early mission goal. Um, maybe not 2024, but uh, maybe after that. In the architectures that we've been studying, uh, we've been looking at, you know, following those 2024 missions where we might spend three to seven days with longer missions uh, beginning by at least 2028. And there's a couple of leading studies that have, have guided us. One is to, well, a couple of approaches, I guess I should say. One is to, you know, establish a single site on the moon where we revisit uh, and we gradually expand the infrastructure. Um, so that would be a, an area that we might uh, emphasize ISRU propellant production, if we could find a, a nice cache of ice and, and so forth. The other one is, is a mobile architecture, and this has been studied in various ways over the last few years, you know, developing a set of assets, delivering them to the moon, and then, you know, they would have some kind of a mobility capability. And you could uh, foresee uh, visiting those assets with a single crew, and then maybe autonomously moving them to a new location where the next crew visits them. And, and so that's an idea that's been studied uh, uh, somewhat in the literature. In terms of power requirements, um, the early missions, you know, are going to be satisfied predominantly with off-the-shelf power systems, the missions that only operate through the day. But beyond that, we're going to need new power systems, and, and they're going to have to supply tens of kilowatts uh, to support ISRU, uh, environmental control. I think Ron brought up the, the very challenging aspects associated with environmental control. Um, and then cryogenic propellant management, things like recharging rovers. Uh, we're going to need a whole new set of power sources to, to do that uh, well. And, and the lunar environment brings with it many challenges for those systems, be it the, the temperatures or the dust or the vacuum. All those things kind of contribute to making our, our power systems really a challenging development. So you didn't ask for it, but I'm going to tell you about Mars, too, because there's a lot of connections between the moon and Mars. You know, our, our efforts uh, in NASA are really it's a moon to Mars, uh, you know, program. So things we do on the moon are, are supposed to be translatable to Mars to get us you know, ready to get to Mars eventually with humans. Um, and it turns out that while we've flown some spectacular missions to Mars, we've never flown any systems that could accommodate a, a human mission, a power systems that is. So we have a lot of work to do there. Um, as far as some of the past systems we've flown, like the Mars Exploration Rover, Phoenix, uh, Mar Mars Science Lab, Curiosity, and now Perseverance, those systems are all less than 200 watts produced. So those aren't likely to be the kind of systems we're going to need to satisfy human missions, which we believe are going to be, you know, again, tens of kilowatts, continuous day and night. The crew is going to be there for an extended period. Uh, we're going to want to try to take advantage of ISRU again on Mars. In this case, it's more likely using the Martian atmosphere and converting it to O2 for either propellant or, um, or uh, oxygen for the astronauts. Um, and we're, by the way, we're doing an experiment on that, uh, on Perseverance now with MOXIE. And I know MIT was a, had a very strong role in that. So uh, hopefully you guys are aware of that. The other thing about Mars missions, and, and it's true on the moon as well, uh, when you land these vehicles on the surface, you can't land them nearby previous vehicles uh, because of the plume that 
is, is produced upon landing or the plume that is produced upon uh, departure. So you, you got to separate these, these assets um, and on the surfaces, either the moon or Mars, by perhaps kilometers. And so there is challenges on the power system to move power among those large distances that we'll have to address. Um, and the Mars environment produced, presents its own set of challenges. We have less sunlight uh, than we do, obviously, on the moon. We have the gravity and the CO2 atmosphere. Uh, we have the big temperature cycles, again, not quite as extreme as the moon. But on Mars, we have these, um, you know, dust storms. Uh, you know, Ron presented the challenges of dust on the moon. Uh, dust on Mars can be even worse uh, because there are dust storms that could last for you know, perhaps months at a time. And that was evident in a recent uh, experience we had, I believe in 2020, uh, where we lost some of our surface assets due to an extended dust storm. Let me do a check. Are you guys still hearing me? Yes, we are. Okay. My video is frozen, so you all look like, uh, you know, uh, just <laughs> pictures. So, Okay, so I wanted to compare side by side these two different uh, mission destinations and, and discuss some of the similarities and differences. Um, you'll notice that from a power requirement standpoint that the moon and Mars are, are very similar. You know, we see crew habs and life support needing tens of kilowatts, ISRU needing tens of kilowatts, storing cryogenic uh, propellant kilowatts and pressurized rover kilowatts. And basically, those requirements are the same on either the moon or Mars. Um, there are kind of big differences in terms of our lander capabilities. So for, for the moon right now, we're flying commercial lunar payload service landers, which are projecting payloads between 10 and maybe 100 kilograms. Eventually, we, we might see 1,000 kilogram or more payloads with, for cargo and humans as part of our human lander sister uh, system program. On Mars to date, we've only landed uh, payloads of hundreds, hundreds of kilograms. I think uh, Perseverance and Curiosity were something on the order of a metric ton. But for human missions, our, our plan is to land 20 metric tons. And so a lot of work to do on, especially on EDL type technologies. I already talked about the distance between assets requiring long distance power transmission. The night duration on the moon is, is obviously severe, as much as 354 hours in the mid-latitudes in the equator. Uh, but a lot of people fail to realize that at the poles where we're pr projecting you know, abundant sunlight, we're still expecting uh, eclipse periods on the order of 120 hours in winter. Um, if you don't know, the moon has seasons um, just like Earth and just like Mars. And, and so uh, the sunlight will vary as a function of time on the moon, especially at the poles. Um, I already talked about solar flux. On Mars, the solar flux can be as low as 100 watts per square meter during a dust storm. Imagine trying to design solar arrays that um, have to accommodate that kind of fall off. Um, let's see. Oh, so at the bottom, uh, you know, two things uh, that, that are distinguished between the moon and Mars. One is that because of the moon's proximity to us, teleoperations are, are likely and we can operate systems from Earth. But on Mars, obviously, our systems are gonna have to be autonomous. So that's a new and additional challenge. And I think Ron pointed out the, the lack of long-term power sources that we have flown on these missions in the past is a, is a real limit in terms of where we need to get, get to for, for human missions. Okay, so if I could make a list of the things I would want in, in power systems, this is it. Um, you know, we want to be able to provide high power. Um, if you've watched the movie Apollo 13, you know that power is a precious commodity. And, you know, without it, uh, astronauts' lives are, are put in danger. So we want to be able to have uh, abundant power sources. They need to live for long life, um, you know, for robotic missions. 15 years probably or more for some of the human missions, probably five years or more and Mars because of the fact that there'll be long uh, periods between crews. Uh, there, there's going to be these, uh, you know, we want the systems to survive multiple crew campaigns. And so 
Uh, long life is obviously important on Mars as well. Uh, high reliability is key, but, and we could do that through redundancy and diverse sources, um, fault detection and recovery. We want systems that are multi-mission. Um, so can they operate on the moon? Can they work on Mars? Can they be adapted for outer planet missions and so forth? Stream environments, we know that on the moon, we got the lunar night. We're also talking about going into permanently shadowed regions where the ice exists. And if so, we go from you know 100K minimum temperature to something like 40 Kelvin. Uh, so that's, that's gonna be a, a very difficult environment to overcome for any system. At Mars, we wanna go to the Northern latitudes because that's where we think ice exists. And, that also happens to be where the sunlight is is the worst. So um, that's an additional challenge for solar power systems that's exacerbated by the dust storms that occur there. At the very bottom, I put mass. Uh, and so it is always the, the tendency for, for engineers and especially power system engineers to minimize mass. But I put that at the bottom of the list because I think all these other things are so much more important. So Yes, we want to at least be as good as the state of the art uh, in terms of mass, but there are so many other expectations on the power system. So we want to make sure that we address those before we start uh, you know, fine tuning the mass. So there are three technologies that I wanted to highlight here that STMD is pursuing. Um, the first one is fission surface power. We uh, uh, called it kilopower for a long time. That name seems to be uh, fading. Uh, I was very involved in the kilopower project that started in 2015. And in 2018, we conducted a test out in the Nevada desert where we demonstrated the full operation of a nuclear fission reactor uh, producing about five kilowatts of thermal heat and, and uh, converting that to about one kilowatt electric through Stirling converters. Um, it was the first time that NASA has pursued a space fission reactor since 1965 when we flew what was called the SNAP-10A. So it was a it really important milestone in space nuclear power because it basically it, uh, provides a new capability uh, for NASA. And it's a small system. Uh, kilopower, again, was only about a kilowatt. And we, and we think we can scale it pretty easily up to 10. But uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg for nuclear technology. The, the point, the really important point, though, is that we need to start small, uh, that if we try to develop the first reactor at megawatt levels or multi-megawatt, we're going to fail. Uh, we've learned that from our history. So with Kilopower, we tried to start small, and we were successful in building and testing this reactor. And we're hoping to leverage that and, and hopefully in the late 2020s fly a lunar uh, 10 kilowatt reactor, there's a program in place to do that and demonstrate a continuous long lived power source on the moon that could be used globally, you know, equatorially or, or at the poles and supply the kind of power levels we would need for ISRU. In the middle is regenerative fuel cells um, and regenerative fuel cells are a, a important technology because they're the next generation of batteries. Uh, you know, battery technology is wonderful, but uh, using it for a 350 hour uh, discharge period over lunar night is quite a challenge for battery technology. Our best batteries are about 150 watt hours per kilogram. Regenerative fuel cells offer the potential for maybe 600 watt hours per kilogram. Uh, it does involve some complicated fluid systems. You have hydrogen and oxygen that that need to be combined in a fuel cell. Um, and then you need to electrolyze the, uh, the byproducts to produce the, the, the supply reactants again. So it's a close system uh, and you, you uh, conserve the, the reactants uh, to make more power on, on multiple uh, night cycles. Uh, but the benefit is high power density uh, beyond what batteries could provide. And so uh, in STMD, we're working on that technology as well in a number of areas. And then the third is uh, large deployable solar arrays. Um, if we go to the poles, the lunar poles, um, the one thing we know is that uh, in order to take advantage of this uh, near perpetual sunlight, 
that occurs during the summer periods on the lunar poles, we're going to need arrays on tall mass to capture that, um, that sunlight on the horizon and get above the terrain, which would cause shadows on lower arrays. So we have a program now called the Vertical Solar Array Technology Project. And yesterday, uh, they just announced the five contract awards uh, to develop that technology further. We're going to do design contracts now that will be followed by um, a down select among the five vendors where we'll actually build and test a vertical solar array suited to a lunar polar mission. Um, so you could look for that in the in the Google if you want. Uh, that announcement was just made yesterday. I think these are things I've already said. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear, I hope it is, that we're gonna need a new generation of power sources for the moon and Mars, especially if we are uh, hope, you know, plan to establish this sustainable human presence. Um, and the power requirements, well, are, they're similar between the moon and Mars. Um, and we could take advantage of, of system technologies if we make good engineering choices. Um, I think the technologies I highlighted, the new small reactors and the RFCs and the large, uh, tall deployable solar arrays are all things we'd want to develop that could be multi-mission. Um, and so those are things, key things that we need to work on. And then finally at the bottom, um, you know, uh, we're, STMD is trying our best to address this problem. We, it's a known problem. We, we consider it a major key investment area. Um, we not only are doing the projects that I highlighted, but I would say, um, you know, maybe a dozen or, or more other power related technology developments looking at things like uh, high voltage power distribution, surface to surface power beaming. We have a project to look at chemical heat uh, power sources. Um, so using reactants to produce heat that could be converted to electricity or providing or provide thermal management. And so those are all kind of key investments in STMD and ones that we hope will eventually get us to this lunar capability where we'll be able to stay there for months or years and, and build the, the confidence to go to Mars. So I'll conclude and take any questions. Appreciate your, uh, uh, um, your attention. Thank you, Lee. This was fantastic. And I'll just say for your um, benefit, very complimentary with what Ron presented. So different topics, but beautifully knitted in together. Um, so thank you for all of that context. I think it's really interesting to see the way that you also, you know, bring us back to this moon to Mars framing, which we've also been talking about in the class. And I love that chart um, where you have the power comparison requirements in, you know, scale of kilowatts between the two. Um, I'll open it up to the class now for at least a couple questions while we still have Lee on the line. Does anybody have a question for Lee? Hey, I'll start off. This is, uh, Lee, this is Jeff Hoffman. Uh, thanks for mentioning Moxie. I'm actually deputy principal investigator. And yes, we here at MIT, we're actually responsible for operating Moxie. It was built at Jet Propulsion Lab, but we only have one JPL engineer still working with us. But uh, just to confirm what, what you said about power requirements, um, one of our students has been working on his, his doctoral work on, on estimating uh, you know, what it would take to uh, ex extend MOXIE type capabilities for a human mission. And the power requirements come anywhere from 20 to 30 kilowatts. And that, that's just for oxygen production. So it, it confirms what you say that, that once you get to a human mission, uh, the power requirements are going to go way up compared to our robotic missions. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, hey Jeff, thank you, I, uh, and thanks to MIT for the outstanding work you guys did on Moxie. I, I, I know Mike hacked a little bit. I, I assume you work with Mike, and yeah, yeah. Uh, probably have crossed paths with you too. And but uh, that was an outstanding development, and really looking forward to the operations that are supposed to start here in the next few weeks. I think. Well, we're hoping that that during the downtime between the successive helicopter flights, you know, they're going to make five flights within about a 30 sol period. And, and hopefully uh, during that downtime, we'll have enough time to produce some oxygen. So stand by. Sounds good. And uh, right. by the way, for the class, I'll, I'll be talking about ISRU and, and more details about MOXIE in a couple of weeks. Indeed. 
And I see we have a couple questions now popping up on the chat. Let's take uh, Vaishdi's question and then Cormac's question, and then we'll need to transition to our next speaker. Uh, I see Cohen has also put a question in there. So Lee, if you're interested in staying, you're more than welcome to stay uh, for the second um, part of class. And it looks like you have some additional questions coming to you via the chat, but we'll start with Vaishdi and then Cormac. Thank you. I'm also interested in Cohen's question about power beaming, so <laughs> I'll throw that in there. Uh, my question is about uh, the electronics for power management and uh, whether there are specific investments uh, that your uh, directorate is doing for that, uh, particularly to take advantage of smart grid type of approaches. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, we actually um, just awarded, there's a program called Luster and maybe somebody can do a Google search and look up Luster, uh, big L, little U, S-T-R. They just awarded a, a number of contracts under that program, one of which is looking at microgrids, uh, I think with Ohio State University. And uh, beyond that, we have a number of projects, one with JPL and one with Glenn Research Center looking at uh, microgrids and the technologies that might support those. Um, I think it's going to be a critical technology, really. Um, as I said, you know, having these assets that are distributed and being able to connect them with, with power is, is going to be crucial. And it's really a whole new ball game. Uh, you know, NASA's never had to do anything like that before. So we're learning a lot from the terrestrial industry, and, and I think we'll try to apply as much as we can. But I know that it's going to require high voltage distribution, you know, to get the cable sizes down. Uh, we are talking about beaming, but, you know, uh, and I see the question, I'll try to answer the beaming question here in, simultaneously. I think beaming is an absolute uh, important technology, but it's a little premature for some of the early missions. I, I think uh, there's a number of interesting technologies there. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you use a beaming, a beam system, a wireless power transfer, you, you need that much more power at your source. So if you have to land that source on the surface uh, and then beam it surface to surface, which is the most likely near term application, you're essentially requiring more source power than you would otherwise if you had a cable uh, transmission. Um, and it could be as much as four times more source power. Um, for laser power beaming, we're talking about systems that are maybe 25 to 30 or 40% efficient at best. And so that means you need to oversize your source. And then uh, at the receiver end, you, you need to accommodate the fact that uh, you're also gonna have losses and and generally um, for a laser beaming system, those losses are, you, you have to reject that waste heat at pretty low temperatures, which puts a big challenge on the thermal management. So I, I love the idea of beaming, but I think that there are complications that we still need to address. Great, thank you, Lee. And Cormac, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, thanks for the presentation, Lee. That was um, really interesting. I was curious, in, in particular, you pointed out uh, the two proposed mission architectures for lunar operations where you have a fixed uh, base location with multiple uh, returns versus a mobile outpost kind of approach. And I was just curious if you could potentially expand upon what kind of compromises might be involved in making a selection like that. Is like, is the moon um, inhomogeneous enough, for instance, to really limit the, the scientific exploration that could occur um, from a single basis location? Um, or could you get most of sort of a work that you'd want the astronauts to be done from a single, single spot? Or, or do we need the mobile sort of approach? Well, it's a great question. And obviously I think NASA is struggling with that question too. And I don't know that we have an answer. I, and I'm probably not the best guy to, to tell you what I think. I, I, I would say that, you know, um, we studied mobile architectures, especially during the Constellation program. And I think the international space exploration community is also looking at mobile arch architectures. Um, the advantage is that it opens up the door for more science, right? I mean, so it's probably a, a competition between human, uh, you know, goals and science goals. If the, the bigger the, the footprint is, 
the, the more science we're going to accomplish. Whereas, um, you know, if we go to a single base and return frequently, it's likely that we could establish a long-term human type, uh, you know, infrastructure and, and then start to live off the land like we want to do with ISRU. So I think those are the competing requirements and as to who will win out eventually, I, I, I don't know. I, I think both have their challenges. Uh, imagine if we send a group of mobile assets to the surface and then have to move them autonomously. I, that, that to me presents some real difficult challenges. Uh, you know, not having crew there to help move things like pressurized rovers around and, and maybe habitats or um, any kind of um, uh, infrastructure that we would want. That, that, that to me presents a, a pretty difficult challenge. But yeah, I, I, I hope that sheds some light on some of the trade-offs. I, I don't know that we have a, a good answer right now. Thank you, Lee, for staying with us to answer a few questions. If the I don't know if you'll be able to see us on our screens, but if the class can just give a round of thanks again, we're all clapping for you. So thank you very much for your time.